I'm glad there are no introductions. It's very business-like, right? So it comes straight to the point. <laughs> so I start by thanking Manoj, David. Yeah, I know. He's coming. David and the office bearers of Skoda. We wait for Mr. Dian Mehta, so they are prepared to join us. I believe he'll start somewhere in, our, in the court. <coughs> and a very warm uh, evening to all of you who aspire to become AORs. Is it now audible? It's not really? Yeah, slow. Can you adjust the sound? Slow. Sound <coughs> increase, <coughs> increase the pitch. More fast. Okay. So the subject of discussion today is professional ethics. I understand this is a topic that is made part of the part three of the one examination that is scheduled in the middle of the month of December. Some of the enactments relevant to the topic are the Advocates Act 1961 that codifies the legal profession and consolidates the law relating to the legal practitioner. It provides for a constitution of a bar council in the All India Bar. The Bar Council of India rules that have been framed by the Bar Council of India in exercise of its rule making powers under the Advocates Act is the second statute. Chapter 2 of the rules is dedicated to standards of professional conduct and etiquette. Then come the Supreme Court rules that have been framed by the Supreme Court in exercise of the powers conferred on it under Article 145 of the Constitution of India. Rules have been amended from time to time, as you know, as recently as in 2019, the last amendment took place. Order 4 of the uh, rules with respect to as with respect to advocates and it's relevant. For being registered as an AOR, the eligibility criteria has been fixed in Rule 5. On an advocate undergoing training for one year with an advocate on record and on passing the examination held by the Supreme Court, one is entitled to be registered as an AOR. That's the background. I believe it's a tough examination. It needs a whole lot of prep preparation and my best wishes to all those who are going to take the exam. For this talk, I shall address you on particular facets of the professional ethics that have been elaborated in chapter two of the Bar Comes from India Rules. So the focus of my discussion is on A, the duty to the court, B, a duty to the client, C, a duty to the opponent, D, a duty to the colleagues, mm -hmm. and I will add two more heads, duty to the profession and duty to the public at large. Instead of a bookish discussion of the duties cast on an advocate that I have just mentioned, I propose to take you through a routine working day in the life of a young practicing advocate on record in the Supreme Court. And request you to see for yourself the manner in which these duties ought to be discharged. So shall we give this protagonist, the young advocate on record, a name? What would you suggest would be an ideal name? If you agree, we will call him Kartavya. Because he owes a lot of duties and it probably fits the bill. <coughs> yeah, they'll join us. That's okay. So I think it would be very nice if you could put away your pens and papers and just enjoy the story as we go along. The lesson is in the story, and I'm sure that you will all carry it with you in your memory. This Kartavya, the protagonist of the AOR narrative, is in his early 30s. He has a, built a small practice as an office come residence in Mayur Vihar. Rule 5, Roman 3 of the Supreme Court rules requires an advocate on record to have an office within the radius of 16 kilometers from the courthouse. It's well within that. Kartabir starts getting ready early enough to head for court. His clerk was to be mandatorily registered. Also arrives on time. The files are bundled into the car and so is the uniform. Mind you, Kartavya does not wear his bangs and coat at home. 
he wears the uniform only on reaching the court complex. Reason? Any guesses? Because the rules of park council expect that the advocate will wear his bands and coats and gown as a uniform only in the court complex and not in public places except on ceremonial occasions. Unlike some of the members of the bar, Kartavya does not flaunt his bands by loosely hanging them on the rear view mirror of his car. <laughs> For all the world to see. The car sticker purchased by, from SCBA is sufficient to identify his car for making an entry into the court complex. Kartavya and his club proceed to court well on time. Knowing that the heavy traffic flow in Delhi in the early hours and is of being aware of the fact that an advocate must be punctual, I highlight that. On reaching the Supreme Court complex and finding a decent parking space, a difficult task today I leave. But when Kartavya wears his uniform, his eyes gleam with pride and his chest puffs up. His neat and tidy appearance adds to his stature. He is conscious of the fact that a shabbily dressed advocate or an advocate wearing a coat with a haphazardly tied soiled band or one wearing a coat and a band with a crumpled gown does not cover the profession with glory. It is a poor first impression of the advocate. By sharp 10 a.m., Kartave has made his way to court corridors armed with his briefs. He is well aware of the importance of remaining present in court when his case is called out. Knowing that his cases are listed high up in two courts on the same day and there can be a clash with a fair chance that he will be held up in another court, Kartave takes care to make alternate arrangements by requesting a colleague to ask for a pass over in the other court. Judgments are, as you know, pronounced before the daily cause list is taken up by the court. In one of his cases, judgment is to be pronounced today. Kartave knows that the decision will go against him in that case. Caught in a bind, what does he do? He skips attending that court and proceeds to focus on the fresh matter. There will be some questions coming up at the end of this talk. To his dismay, the first matter takes longer than he had expected. He is receiving repeated messages from his colleague about the other matter that has already been passed over and is about to be called again by the adjoining court. So what does Kartavya do? He knows he cannot leave the first matter in the midst of the hearing. So he asks the court for permission to leave. And on being granted permission, he proceeds to the other court where the case is about to reach. Here, Kartabe has briefed a senior advocate to argue the matter. His clerk has taken care to place the relevant case law along with the brief in the court and furnish an advanced list of citations to the courtmaster for reference of the court. Kartabe discovers that the senior he had engaged is held up in another court, so he's not getting another pass over. But as a disciplined lawyer, he is prepared with the brief. He knows his facts. He is aware of the law. He is conscious of the fact that courts do not take kindly to lawyers sauntering into the, in, into the court with no brief in hand or when they are blank about the facts in a case or simply stand up to ask for an adjournment or a pass over. When Kartavya's case is called, he takes care to seek prior permission from the court to allow the senior advocate briefed by him to take over from him whenever he comes and thereafter starts addressing arguments. He notices that his opponent is arguing non-stop in a high pitch and he can hardly get an opportunity to open his case. On questions being posed by the honorable judges, the opposite counsel keeps on trying to speak over the court. This habit is not only annoying, it is most unacceptable. Advocates ought to show the courtesy to his colleagues 
and refrain from interjecting in the middle of the arguments. This is as much an etiquette as any other etiquette that we read about in the rules. They must patiently wait for their turn to come. But there also gathers an impression that the other side is trying to mislead the court on facts, which is a big no -go. On conclusion of the arguments, the presiding judge starts dictating the order. Realizing that some relevant facts have been overlooked by the court, Kartavya does not immediately jump up to interject the dictation. Instead, he makes a note and waits for the court to finish the dictation to enable him to point out the facts that according to him had been missed out in the order. The case goes against Kartavya's client, unfortunately. He is disheartened, but he knows that he gave it his best shot. He also knows that he discharges duty towards his client to the best of his ability. He does not paint a rosy picture to the client. He had fairly prepared him about the weaknesses of his case. Kartavya steps out of the court and on seeing a missed call from his client, he informs him of the outcome of the case and tells him to come over in the office in the evening for a discussion. Being a young practitioner, he has only a couple of matters listed in the court today, which get over well before lunchtime. So what does he do now? Should he go looking out for his friends and hang around in the corridors with a fresh and honest coffee cup in his hand? It then occurs to him that an important case is going on before the constitution bench that is being argued by some leading senior advocates. During his training in days as an ad with an advocate on record, he was always advised to sit in court where an interesting or an important matter may be going on, to observe how arguments are being addressed, to see how legal issues are developed, to observe what are the nuances of law and the manner in which a seasoned lawyer addresses the court and each other. So Kartavya decides to skip the coffee and he proceeds to court one where the constitution bench had assembled on that day and is hearing an important legal issue. While watching the proceedings, he notices an elderly advocate has been standing in the aisle for a long time and looked fatigued. What does Kartavya do? He does not remain glued to his chair. He gets up and offers his chair to his senior advocate. When the matter gets over, Kartavya does not rush out of the courtroom before the judges rise. He extends the courtesy of waiting for the court to rise. He bows in a respectful manner to the court and leaves the court only after the judges have left the dais. This is a courtesy, unfortunately, that many have forgotten. By now, half a day is over. Kartavya goes out looking for a friend to have a lunch together. On the table in the canteen, he hears some audacious conversation going on between some colleagues who were busy tearing apart a judge from whose court they had just exited. Kartavya is extremely embarrassed. He knows it is the duty of an advocate not to malign a judge or be a party to such wild gossip. He also remembers being told by his senior colleagues that it is the judgment that is open to criticism and not the judge. Kartavya is equally shocked at some scandal mongering being indulged in by some other members of the bar in respect of a lady colleague. There is a discussion about her personal life and some unkind remarks were being made about her. He and his friends keep quiet and diplomatically move away from the table to sit elsewhere and have their lunch. In the course of having this lunch with his friend, a junior from his law college who had just entered the profession approaches Kartavya with a request to guide her in a matter. As a dutiful senior colleague, he lends a helping hand to the young girl and tells her that he has come across a similar case recently and has the relevant case law and the citation that would be of some assistance to her. He assures her that he would message the citations to her very soon. The day is over in court. Kartavya is, as Kartavya is walking back to the car park, he finds a battery of news reporters interviewing an advocate on a pending matter in court in which his client is also a party. 
Kartavya smiles and reminds himself that an advocate must not encourage publicity in the press in respect of a subjudice matter. He discreetly moves out of the range of the press and walks to his car, planning for the rest of the day. On returning to his office along with his club, Kartavya pulls out the files of the pending matters that he proposes to draft today. In the meantime, the client who he had spoken to in the morning arrives, the one whose case he has lost. He explains how the matter went in court and why they could not succeed. But he does not give a false hope to his client by offering to immediately file a review petition or a curative petition. In the meantime, another client referred to him by a colleague from a state high court arrives in his office to file an assembly. This is a crafty client. He starts by asking Kartavya if he could manage the bench. And if he could not, could he approach a distant cousin of the presiding judge and engage him to avoid that bench? Kartavya roundly ticks off the client. He knows that a responsible member of the legal fraternity should not encourage any such discussion and should nip any such conversation in the bud. He also knows that it is unethical to exhibit familiarity with a judge or engage an advocate with the sole idea of avoiding a particular bench. On being reprimanded, the client starts <coughs> discussing his case on merits. Kartavya notices that there, are, there is something that his client is hiding from him. He slowly breaks down the barrier to make him more comfortable, to enable him to open up. After all, the advocate is like a doctor. And he is in a position to give proper advice only if he is apprised of all the relevant facts of the case. Kartavya assures his client that the conversation between them is privileged and will always remain confidential. Section 126 of the Act. When he realizes that instead of entering into a prolonged litigation, it will be in the interest of his client to opt for one of the ADRs like mediation, which may bear quick results, Kartavya takes the planes to explain the entire process to the client from A to Z and persuades him to go in for mediation in the first instance. After convincing the client and obtaining specific instructions from him, he proceeds to draft an application. In the meantime, he calls out to his clerk and tells him to remind him of the last date for getting registered with the Supreme Court Mediation Center for undergoing the training of a mediator. He realizes the fact that mediation is an important tool and if he were to hone his skills as a mediator, it would add a feather in his cap. Stopping here for a moment, while Kartavya is still drafting that application, I must tell you that an advocate who is a mediator has a different set of skills, separate rules of ethics of neutrality and confidentiality. Unlike a lawyer who is expected to argue his client's case to the hilt, a mediator must carefully listen to the parties and develop the ability, uh, ability to help them come up with a win-win solution for both sides. The underlying aim of mediation is to help parties overcome negative human values through an amicable dispute resolution, which will buy peace and bring harmony in their relationship. Coming back to Kartavin, by now he has drafted the application and moved on to the next brief on his table. The client had to furnish some documents here. On scanning the document sent, he finds that a few of them are quite fishy. He calls up the client who gives him some ambiguous answers as to the source of the document. Kartavya's antennas ought to have risen at that point. He knows that he should not knowingly tender any suspicious or false documents or produce a false witness. Any such mistake would cost him dearly in his career. Misleading the court would belie the trust that is reposed in an advocate who is first and foremost an officer of the court. Once the confidence in an advocate is shaken, his reputation can get seriously tarnished. But Kartavya accepts the version of his client and decides to file the documents. 
So just as he is winding up for the day, his clerk approaches him with a request to take up a motor accident claim matter filed by a distant relative of his in the village who cannot afford a fee. Kartavya is not just a is responsible advocate, he is also a kind human being. He is conscious of the fact that the legal profession is not all about making money. It is also about keeping the standards of the bar high and giving back to the community and the society. He offers to take on the case pro bono. But when a gentle suggestion is made to him of taking a cut from the proceeds of the MACT claim at the end of the litigation, he lets it pass and simply tells his client, his clerk to ensure that a NOC is obtained from the previous counsel before he is engaged and he proceeds to file this for Kalat now. I must remind you that an advocate is prohibited from stipulating a fee contingent on the results of the litigation or agreeing to share the proceeds of the litigation. An advocate cannot receive any share or interest in any actionable claim. He should not directly or indirectly bid or purchase in his own name or through a Benami any property sold in execution of a decree of the court or an order in a proceeding where he was professionally engaged. He should keep a meticulous account of the money entrusted by his client to him. He should not, without the consent of his client, divert any portion of the expenses towards his fee. Non-payment of the entire or part fee should not be a ground for the advocate to refuse to return the brief to the client. With this, Kartave calls it a day. He is fatigued by now. It has got rather late. He had promised his family that he will be back home on time to join them for dinner. As usual, he couldn't keep his promise. They must have gone to sleep by now. Lights are out. So, before I discuss the rest, I'll add a disclaimer. In case there's a Kartavya who's an advocate or a Kriyomar here, <laughs> the story is not about him. It is a purely fictional character that has come to me as I was invited by Spora to address you on what are the professional etiquettes and ethics that a lawyer should follow. So this was a script of a long and exhaustive day in the life of a young advocate on record. In this narrative, do you think that Kartavya has been successful in discharging his Kartavya to the court, to his clients, to his adversaries, to himself and the public? No one is perfect. An imperfect advocate is the first step towards scaling perfection. The process is ever evolving. Now, I leave you with some questions relating to professional ethics. Hearing what I narrated to you, what do you think should Kartavya have done? Should he have remained present in court when the judgment was going to be pronounced in the another court before attending to his matters of the day? I hope that all of you have are common on the view that he should have. You can't be absent in court when a judgment is being pronounced. Whether whatever be the outcome, <coughs> the advocate is expected to extend that courtesy to the court. Next, was Kartavya and his friends right in remaining silent spectators and moving away from the lunch table where gossip was going on about a judge and a lady colleague's reputation was being besmirched? Should he not have taken any positive action? Just think about it. What would you have done if you were in the shoes of Kartavya? Next, should Kartavya have categorically refused to file suspicious documents handed over to him by his client? Let us not forget that a false affidavit that an advocate may file can put into jeopardy his entire advocate on record career. It is a serious responsibility that an advocate on record owes to the court when he puts his pen on the paper and signs the document. Anything said in that document and anything filed on the court file is the responsibility of the advocate on record. He can't shirk it off by saying that he was given this by somebody else and he just assumed that it has been read and he signed it. 
it's just not acceptable. Four, should Kartavya have ignored the broad hint given to him to accept a cut from the proceeds of the MACT claim likely to be received by his client in lieu of his professional fee? Would you have done the same? What would you have done if such an offer was made to you? Highly lucrative that it may be. Last, has Kartavya discharged his duty to himself and his family? Should he not have made that effort to wind up a bit early and go home to spend some quality time with his loved ones? I think many of us would feel guilty on this count. <laughs> it happens all the time. There are so many excuses that we make for returning home late. And who is the biggest sufferer? The family. And they take it because they love you. It's very important for an advocate to balance his work and his life, personal life, and maintain it. And that is how probably he would last longer in the career, in the profession, and remain a happy professional, a successful professional, and a happy man, and a happy woman at home. In a nutshell, professional ethics is a compendium of some written and some unwritten rules from that form a code of conduct for the legal practitioner. Some things are left unsaid. It is the, for the advocate to take a call and ask himself if he is on the right track. That little voice within us must never be drowned in the catechism of our side. Permit me to conclude with these inspiring words of Mr. Nani Parthiwala, the famous jurist, who had to say this on being a lawyer, and I quote, when it comes to the end of our day and the evening arrives, I hope we will be able to say to ourselves that while we entered the profession to do well, we stayed in the profession to do good.